say hi. Hi. Um, and we are here to talk about um, how you start selling game design services. And uh, we would like to understand sort of where you're at, right? We want to meet you where you are. So if you can start by typing into the chat, like where you are with your business, um, are you planning to go into consulting? Are you just curious? Basically, why did you come and what you're hoping to get out of this? Um, it's going to take a little bit for those answers to filter back to us. But in the meantime, I thought we might introduce ourselves and um, talk about why we decided to do this panel. Um, both Jay and I work as consultants in various roles selling games. I also do a lot of pitching and uh, funding games in my day job as a professor of game design. Um, and we both started out with a, without sort of a lot of um, name recognition. People didn't know who we were. And uh, we want to help you do this in a much less painful way than we had to, right? We were sort of learning on our own. So maybe, Jay, you can do a little introduction, and then I'll introduce myself. And then um, our wonderful moderator, Melissa, will get us a sense of who's in the Zoom and how we can best help you today. Awesome. Um, hi, I'm Jay. My company is Prototype Thinking Labs. Um, you may also know me by my game design studio, Vermillion Games. We are a consulting firm, um, and I started the company about four or five years ago, and we use LARP techniques to help companies and uh, large organizations, or actually organizations like large and small, from small, from like, you know, some of the big, biggest tech companies out there to tiny startups or individual businesses to nonprofits. Um, build and solve uh, new problems or create new designs. And we use game-based techniques to help them validate those designs before they launch them. So we've worked with companies like UNICEF, Google, Autodesk, uh, Intuit, um, as well as you know a lot of tiny organizations. And um, our typical deal sizes for our project is going to be between 20,000 and 150,000. And um, I love, love corporate sales. Like I love the process of scoping a project, bidding a project, and convincing people to pick you to be the person who works for them. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk about how, if you're going to get into the route of getting large organizations to give you large amounts of money, um, how to go about doing it. Great. Uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, and I'm, I'm Jessica Hammer. Uh, I co-run the O Lab at Carnegie Mellon University, where I'm a, a professor in the Human Computer Interaction Department, basically, where I do research on games, and the Entertainment Technology Center, which is our professional game development program, um, where I teach, but also where I manage a practice as a professional game designer. Um, and in addition, I do con external consulting on game projects. So my life is sort of games, games, with the side of games. Um, but uh, like Jay, even though I'm not in a commercial context most of the time, uh, the work that I do depends on finding funding. And um, I fund games in a very fun, fun work in a very large range of sizes, from probably 5,000 at the low end, um, all the way up to a quarter million plus um, large projects. And so um, between the two of us, we have experience experience with a wide range of where does money come from, how do you get it, what is the value that you're offering, um, and how do you persuade people to give you money for making awesome games. Um, so uh, that's what we want to help you with today. Melissa, you want to give us a little bit about our audience? Who's, a, who's in the room today? Uh, and for those listening, this disembodied voice is Melissa Lewis Gentry, the moderator for this panel. Um, uh, so I'm going to be reading off screen names as best I can. Uh, uh, Atli Kowadl, um writes, uh, thanks for running this. I'm an operations employee, possible consultant, and a gamer. Uh, uh, they're interested in uh, adding uh, game design as a portfolio piece. Uh, and then we have Joe Sixpack 007. I love this. Um, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I get to use educational role play in about 10% of my job. I'd love to expand my skills and the portion of my time that I get to spend on design and facilitating EduLARP. Um, we have a screen named Game Biologist who says, I work for a government agency and I'm interested in finding out where independent designers are coming from in terms of best practices. 
and if I want to pitch the idea of custom games for outreach to any of our NGO partners. Um, Curzon writes, hi, I'm a game design professor and part-time part -time tabletop game designer who has worked on one previous game project in the for semi-retirement. Uh, and finally, um, Huggy Ray says, hi, thanks for running. I'm hoping to start a business writing, uh, writing slash running LARPs when I finish my PhD and interested in considering different possible target markets. So I just wanted some sort of beginner's idea uh, how to do this. Uh, oh, and we got some more people. Um, uh, Kevin Culp is here. Hey, Kevin. Um, I'm just uh, on the verge of bidding a game design for a large educational corporation and have no idea how to price it. Um, and then Darren Watts, never heard of that guy. Um, uh, I said, as I do a bit of consulting right now, and I'm always looking to expand that side of the business. Um, uh, we'll cut it there. People, if you are coming in late, please feel free to introduce yourself, and uh, we'll try to get to that later. But let's kick it back to Jay okay. and Jessica. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, we thought that we might start out by telling you, giving you just some quick examples of three case studies of what we've done at different price points to give you a sense of what you might be selling and what you're not selling, right? And Jay and I have very different perspectives here um, because we have different resources in terms of like, what is the thing that our clients and partners are paying for? So I'm gonna start with a, a low end project. This is a project where our um, research partner gave us about $10,000 to build a bunch of prototypes. So um, we worked with um, Philips Health on uh, what we call sleepy games. Uh, th this came about because I um, uh, was part of a, a speaker series where um, Phillips came in and they wanted to hear a bunch of people talk about their research. And um, what that gave me the opportunity to do was listen and see what they were really interested in. And I just sent the speaker, uh, the person who coordinated the speaker series an email afterwards and said, you know, I think there's this really interesting overlap and I think that I can do a lot for a very small sum of money. Um, and so uh, they gave me $10,000 to produce um, non-digital prototypes of games that would help support healthy sleep, as well as um, get those games into some players' hands and report playtesting results. Um, so in that case, the funding was really to create a bunch of prototypes that were targeted at making a transformation in the player and for some very, very early research, not sort of, you know, formal controlled studies, but just will people play these? Are they fun, right? Like, are people uncomfortable with the notion of sleepy games? Um, and that is kind of helping them think about their strategy in this area in the future. Uh, Jay, you want to talk about product testing? Um, sure. Let me actually do two. I'll do a small one first. Um, so the the many years ago, I actually did do a consulting project on just for games for NASA, and that was it was a while ago. So it was like in the ten to twenty k range, um, and they were creating some training simulations. And they wanted somebody to design a game component of it that would be similar to the simulations that they were running, but not uh, identical, so that they could run controlled experiments about the effectiveness of specifically their training content versus you know, the effectiveness of people just interacting and being creative together. Um, so that was something where we got that project through a contact um, who knew the project organizer and also had been playing games with us. Um, and said, hey, what you need for this is a LARP. And then we made that introduction, um, just kind of talked through what we would do for it, quickly designed uh, the project, submitted a, a very short proposal with that. Um, and it was just uh, literally going in and running a game LARPs for them on two separate days. And afterwards, um, NASA did want to keep the IP on those um, to continue running their experiments afterwards. Uh, do you, let me do my second one and then I'll, and then you can do your second one maybe. Um, so the, these days my bread and butter at work is um, running simulations of, um, of potential things, products and solutions that people can design with the humans that will actually be using them, right? So for example, if you are a large corporation and you want to create a new product that um, you know, using a new technology you've acquired that 
uh, exists that engages your existing customer base, um, and you want to know whether you're designing it right. Then we, without before you invest millions of dollars in, you know, like developing out the software and producing the actual work of the product. Um, and this I have to be a little bit general about because I'm a trillion NDAs, so I have to kind of give a general case here. So um, in the, in that sort of case, the we have uh, we come in and we bring in real potential customers of the product, and we essentially they take like a, a prototype mock-up of what the product would be, and we have them LARP through real scenarios where they would be interacting with them in order to figure out you know, what the major touch points are, like what their actual genuine reaction is, right? And it's it's fascinating because uh, in the user testing space, it's right now it's all about surveys and, you know, kind of A-B testing and digital testing. Um, and we took this perspective that LARP surfaces subconscious reactions in humans that are genuine, right? Um, and really shows you what the human side of a reaction is. And we use that to disrupt the field of user testing. I want to give is a large project. Uh, we've gotten about uh, $200,000 in funding for this project so far, where we actually just responded to an RFP. Um, and this was not an RFP looking for games work. Um, it was looking for novel ways to collect data sets to use tra to, to train AIs. But one of the things that I do in my work is I'm always looking out for where games can offer a solution to a problem someone already has. So we applied for the RFP, we won it, um, and uh, we uh, delivered a digital game uh, as well as a, a sample data set to show how our game-based method could create data sets that were different from other methods of generating data sets. Um, and so, you know, these are the cases that we've given you are just to show you the range of how flexible you might need to be about where your funding is coming from and uh, the scope and scale of the work that you're doing. Um, what we have found is that it is much easier to tune from small projects to large projects than to go from nothing to your first project. And so we're particularly interested in helping you with that transition. Um, so we're going to start by talking about where do clients come from? Jay, you want to begin? So for us, um, there's kind of three different ways that people are ready to give you money. Uh, the first one is, and I see this being discussed in chat as well, the RFP, which is the request for a proposal. So this is a team that has decided already that they know that they want some a solution to a problem and they have put out a public call um, to to say like go and submit a bid and tell me how much it would cost and how you would solve this problem. Um, Jessica is really good at winning RFPs uh, but that is a competition. Um, the second one is that they is less formal than that. They know that they want someone to come in and design a game for them or solve a problem for them um, but they are not sure who yet so they're kind of having private behind the scenes conversations with a few potential vendors. And the third one is they don't actually know that they have a problem yet. They're just curious what you can do for them. And then you come in with a proposal. Um, and we typically live in cases two and three. And we meet our clients through, actually our biggest source of clients right now is referrals, is people who've already worked for us um, and you know moved on to a different team or who did a training with us in the past. We also meet clients through giving a, a lot of free talks at conferences. Um, and a lot of free workshops so that people can kind of see what it is. When you when what you're selling is something so experiential, um, then kind of you can't just run an ad and say, hey, do you want a game to solve your problem, right? The way you can if you're selling to a con consumer because they're like, oh, this game seems cool. I will drop $30 on it. But you can't be like, this game seems cool. I'm going to drop $30,000 on it, right? Um, so you kind of need to be able to get into those conversations about what problems people In, in my world, those are the three main um, uh, avenues, but uh, I guess I live more in the RFP space um, and in the relationship space. So um, in terms of looking for RFPs, one of the key things that's really been important for me is 
looking not just for RFPs that use the word game in them, but RFPs where there's a problem yes. that my experience as a game designer yes. helps me figure out how to solve. That's right. And and my rule of thumb is basically, um, is this a, you know, is this a problem that involves people being playful, that involves people being creative, that involves people being voluntary, right? That really gets into the space of playful experience. Um, because that's the place where I know that I can shine as a designer. You're going to know where you shine as a designer, right? Maybe you're really all about perfect mechanical balance in your systems. And you can look for RFPs where you can match your strengths to what they need done, even if they don't know that they need game design to help them do it. The other thing that I want to say is um, about referrals. A lot of my referrals come from talks I give, but I give relatively few talks at places that are oriented towards games, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Because the people who have the money are not necessarily coming to the game conferences, or if they are, they're coming to industry-facing things like GDC or Games for Change. Um, so, you know, you want to be, you want to think not about where are my peers that I can talk to, right? That, that's not where the money comes from. It's right. where, what kinds of conferences are the people who need me going to? And, and I, that will help you make some strategic decisions about how to spend your time. Go ahead, Jay. And I think that's such a brilliant and such an important point because money is attached to problems. People much less frequently attach money to games qua games. And very Sorry. rarely at the 50K and higher mark are people shopping for a game solution, um, unless they explicitly want somebody to build a game to solve a problem. Um, but uh, at the same time, these are people who have like gone through life having their problems solved without a game design perspective ever before. And we who are the designers know like how much power the game design perspective brings. And when they hear that, it's like, it's amazing. Like they get really inspired, right? They're like, oh my God, I can solve my problem and still have fun. And it's dynamic and it's engaging. And I know games are the new big thing, but I don't really know how. And you're like telling me the story of how I can like take this thing that I never thought was a games problem and make it a games problem. Um, and that's much more electric. That gives you a huge edge on being able to win this kind of otherwise relatively dry space. And I will say, add on uh, speaking at conferences, that industry conferences for really boring shit that you would never think of, like ceiling manufacturers, um, they have a lot of money. Uh, you know, they gather tons of people, they gather tons of companies with a lot of money, um, and they are dying for more engaging content. Um, so if you go to the conferences and say, look, I can make a game about ceiling manufacturers for free, um, let, give me a session about this, then you're essentially putting your sales pitch in front of like their thousands of attendees. And then all the ceiling manufacturers have to meet together every year. You cannot contract the conference and say, hey, you know, we'll, we'll create an experience to keep your people engaged now that you're doing virtual conferences. Yeah. You're worried your ceiling manufacturers are just going to wander off because, you know, you don't have them, can't see them in the room in front of you. Uh, so we can create an experience that you might even be able to get them to pay you. That's a really good example of an audience that has a problem and has money, and you can explain yeah. to them why you can solve their problem. And um, document, document. Every time you deliver something, yes. take pictures and share and kind of make it look great. And then the people who are involved will also be incentivized. Sorry, I cut you off. That, but that, right. So, but what if you don't have anything that to document, right? What if you have never um, sold an event before? So how do you pitch these people and convince them that a game can be the kind of solution that they're looking for and that you can deliver it? In the former case, um, you want to have um, a set of three really compelling examples at different sort of levels of investment or different price points. And for that, you really want something specific, right? Like um, so-and-so made such and such a game for this organization, and um, here's the problem it solved for them, right? That's one direction we could go. The second, and you want to give them the name so that they can go and Google it and see that it's real and point their bosses toward it, right? And the examples that you choose should also be aligned with your special sauce as a designer, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, my special sauce is doing transformational games because I have a deep understanding of 
um, sort of psychology and learning theory, and I can actually embody those in game mechanics to help make games that transform their players, right? That's my special sauce. When I choose examples for my own portfolio or external examples, I always want examples that lead people to go, yeah, that's the special sauce we need. Then all you have to do is say, and by the way, not only am I a game designer, but I have your special sauce, right? And that makes you, even if you haven't made a game before for this kind of client or in this space, it makes you much more credible because you can show that you have the skills that they need above and beyond game design. And there's always things you'll need to show you have above and beyond game design. Uh, basic professionalism, right? But also things like um, event planning, right? That's not my, my sphere, but really important for Jay is to be able to run an amazing experience, right? For me, that's integrating research and doing research and making sure that stuff is based on a solid research foundation. Yeah, I don't know what yours is, you should look at what you do besides game design to understand how you sell yourself as a game designer. I'm going to turn over to Jay because I know she, uh, she has a couple more things to say. And here's the thing about examples. Um, and if you're someone who, when I started this, people are like, "You share, give me some examples, give me some case studies, give me your portfolio. And I like froze up and it gave me like anxiety for honestly like two years because I was like, oh my God, I don't have a great portfolio. Like, you know, I don't know how can I share, right? But the thing is that people don't want examples to judge you. They want examples to visualize what it would be like to do the thing because they've never done the thing before. Your examples in your portfolio aren't your resume, right? They're not your grades. They're not like saying like, check it out. I got A plus like in like, or, you know, B plus or whatever in like all of these things because nobody is judging you. Like the other thing about the corporate world is that like people are just like way less judgy than they are in the consumer world because it's their job to spend the money, right? Um, so like you, whatever story you tell, it doesn't have to be really precisely a reflection of your career. The, the purpose of your examples is to make it easy for them to imagine what it would be like to work with you. And if you have to fudge or simplify or kind of explain out or like place a real detail with a fake detail to make it clearer some of the case studies as long as like you know you're not like straight up lying to people about what you've done like that actually just helps the clarity of the explainer the way that i think about it is you tell them a story and you make sure that they can access the details if they need it yeah right but the the, the other thing they'll use their your portfolio and your examples for um and i notice i'm saying portfolio and examples because you may or may not have your own prior work to show, but that's okay, because they need to sell it to their bosses, right? They need to go, this thing is cool. And by the way, this person's gonna fix it for us. So you really kind of want to think about the, what's the conversation they're gonna have when you're not in the room to someone who knows even less about this than the person you're pitching to, right? So you just want to give them the chance to be like, this is awesome, right? It's a story about Let's them. Stop. Oh, it's a story about them. That's right. We have a problem. This person is going to fix it better than we could get it fixed otherwise. And the bar is often surprisingly low, right? Just think about the most boring corporate training you've ever been to. That's the bar, right? Every single one of you can do better than that. The question is just showing them that you can do it and making them believe it. I want to stop and see if we have questions from uh, our. Uh, chat stream. Uh, right now, we don't have questions. Oh, we, uh, sorry, I'm lying. We, right now, we do have questions. Hey. Um, hey. Uh, uh, so, uh, Jason Morningstar asks, question, uh, can you talk about uh, talking to potential customers who reflexively assume digital and you need to explain or sell them on an analog solution? Great question. Uh, Jay, do you want to take that or shall I? Yeah. Or both. Go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. Um, so it's a good question. A lot of people will immediately assume that games mean digital. And uh, the way that I usually address this with clients is to talk about um, how the goal here is to solve their problem. And a digital solution is going to cost more. It's going to take longer. And actually, it's not really necessary in order to get the power of games, right? So you start from their problem and from the fact that they have limited resources, they have limited time, they have limited money. Um, I have said to people, right, I can do this for $50,000 if we're looking at an analog solution and $250,000 if we're looking at digital. 
you know, they'll be equally successful because I'll be implementing the same underlying model. You know, what do you think? And you can talk to them about ways that you can amplify the analog so they feel that they're getting value for their money. So for example, one thing you can do is you can say, and we'll provide uh, training materials, right? So that when you're doing this, if you're doing this with people who've never done it before, you can like train new facilitators to do it. Um, because that's one thing that they are implicitly worried about when they say digital versus analog is analog requires time from people. So anything you can do to reduce that cost for them and amortize, help them like not just not just incur more costs later, but actually to keep the cost of the analog low both to them up front and of actually implementing it, um, that can be a really helpful strategy. Jay? I think you said it better than I could. All right. Any other questions from the group? Yeah, we've got a flood of them. Uh, next question is from uh, Kevin Culp. Uh, what criteria do you use when pricing a project? Oh, yeah, let's totally oh, talk great. about that. That was actually literally the next topic that was on our outline. So we'll talk about this and then we'll come back for more questions. Jay, why don't you start? All right. Um, so pricing. Uh, I love pricing as a topic. So important things to know about pricing are first, um, money is not a sensitive topic. And this can be really counterintuitive to us because like the difference between like 10,000 and 40,000 is like, you know, could be like half your annual income. Um, but the thing is that these are people who by definition, part of their job description is to spend the money and it is not their own money. Um, and they have to spend it by the end of the year or they will not get it back next year. Um, so they're looking for ways to spend the money, which means that unlike if you're selling to a consumer who's like, oh God, do I drop $100 on this game or not? Um, you know, or do I do something else with my life, right? Like they're considering, um, do I spend the money in this way on you or in a different way anyway? Um, so the first thing I encourage everyone to do when you think about pricing is just to have those conversations up front. And there is no money question that you should be afraid to ask. Um, Literally, in every call, I say, what budget are you envisioning for this? In most cases, because they know that they're in a stronger negotiating position than me, they say, I don't know how much do you want to charge, right? Because like they still can get a better rate from you if whoever says money first is you know, in a slightly worse, quotes first in a slightly worse position, right? Um, but then I'll say something like, um, well, typically a project like this is a 40 to 65K project, depending on some details I can work out later. And then that gives them a chance to immediately react, right? So they'll say like, you know, um, oh, my budget is something closer to 15. Or they'll say, yeah, that doesn't give me a heart attack. And they'll be like, oh, okay. And I was like, oh, they said, oh, okay, I should have gone higher. Um, but the point is that uh, pricing, the way that we do it is that we tell a story. We, after we get have that initial exchange where I have some information about where their anchors are, right? Like I'll go back and I will create create a proposal with three different price tiers, as uh, Jessica mentioned, where um, I'm outlining like three different versions of what I'm delivering at different amounts. And the, the and there has to be a cohesive story behind all of these th price tiers, right? But they will not be shy about pushing back on you and saying, I want tier number, these features in tier number two, but is there a way we can get that at under you know, this price? Um, and then it's just a practical conversation that you guys have about what you can do at what number you have. Uh, another thing that will help is that every organization has price tiering and approval bracket. So it's like under this amount of money, like for example, in our industry, it's usually like under around 10,000 is a certain level of approval. Under 20,000 is another level. Under 100,000 is another level. Under 250 is another level. Um, so it's totally fine to ask your point of contact, like what is the approval bracket we're talking about? And you know, what is the, the amount past which we'd have to go one boss up in order to approve this? Um, and then you can keep your pricing within that range. I use, um, I, I guess, almost the opposite strategy, which is I, I actually straight up say to people, if you wanna work with me, here are the three major price points that I, I work at, and here's the amount oh, of effort that I can put toward a project at each price point, right? So, and again, um, talking about money is weird, but I'm just gonna be transparent. Um, so the at, at this point in my career, uh, the lowest price point for working with me is $25,000 for a semester, right? That gets 15 weeks of effort and a certain amount of hours, right? Uh, the second price tier is $80,000. 
And the third price tier is $250,000 with a two-year minimum. So um, people, that lets me be clear about money without actually being the one who mentions money first. I put them in a position where they say, oh yeah, we were thinking in the $80,000 range and then we can negotiate, right? Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down if they want more, or if they want less. Um, but I found that really helpful. But it sounds like the question is asking, once you have a project, how do you put a price point on it? So I will say that if, if I ever have to do things that way, if they're like, we're gonna fund work X and you have to get that done, how much do you want for it? Um, I, uh, there's some very good freelance calculators out there. They basically all recommend essentially figure out how long it's gonna take and then charge for double the time because you're gonna need it. So um, I base my cost calculations almost entirely on person hours, how many people is gonna take, how many hours, um, and that, that, that doubling, that overhead accounts for things like, you know, um, the time it's gonna take to recruit the right person and the time it's gonna take to train them, right? The hours that they're gonna spend on this project that are not actually about turning out a result. How then do you estimate how many hours it's going to take someone to do something? Honestly, I'm terrible at it. So um, I uh, have a, a sort of advisory board of people I ask for advice about specific things. So there's someone I call up when I have a technically complex project. And I say, you know, I've estimated it'll take an experienced programmer about 300 hours to do this. Here's the feature list of what they're going to do. Am I way off, right? And sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not. So you are lucky that you're embedded in a community with lots of people who are grappling with this problem. Um, I won't speak for Jay, but I am certainly available. If you want me to sanity check something for you, I will totally do that. Um, and uh, you, know, you don't have to rely just on your own self, but the more you can do about specking out this is what person X will do. This is how long it will take. I think it will take them. These are the deliverables. Like if you do that for each person you're thinking about hiring, um, you're going to be able to get a lot more clarity and a lot more accuracy. Um, yeah. And then you want to build in the freelance overhead. And me Go too. Ahead. Feel free to hit me up anytime. Sorry. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of a lag in the. Um, I also want to call out on the subject of pricing, like. Uh, this kind of transparent anxiety that we have when we start out consulting, right? Which is, what if I price too high and they walk away? And we kind of want to price ourselves as low as possible to get them to do the job, like emotionally. Don't do I that. Mean, yeah, don't do that. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, don't do that. You're going to want to do that. Don't do that. And like, I will say, like, we all went through this, right? Like, and when I was starting out, like, there's nothing I wouldn't have done for $5,000, like my first year, right? Like, sure, it would be great if I could have gotten them to give me $20,000 for it. But honestly, I would have done exactly the same thing for $5,000. Because like, that would have, you know, like, kept me alive for quite some time. Right? Um, so that's okay. Um, and as you do more projects, you'll get a better sense of your own pricing. Um, but if you want to avoid pricing someone out, um, the specific technique that we've used is that we have the story of how we price ourselves, which is our ideal way of pricing ourselves, right? We have the number that we typically work at, and then we have our secret walk away number. Um, so on the call, I'll say like, you know, well, usually this is a $20,000 project, but since you're a nonprofit, I'll do it for 10, uh, you know, if you need to negotiate lower than we can do that. Or I'll say like, we have an annual um, budget for pro bono work that we can kind of tell me what your budget is and I can pull from that just to go down from my number, right? And like I might have said, like typically this is 20,000, typically because I have set an expert, a standard in my head that I just made up like five minutes ago on this call, right? This is early on, <laughs> but you know, if you're early on, like, um, and then that like, and it puts them in a position of negotiating with you. And then I know that in my mind, I would walk away at even like eight. Right. Um, and, you know, then at the end of the day, like the more projects that you do, kind of the more you'll get a feel for how it makes sense to value your time. But asking for less money will not necessarily is not usually not the one of the top three factors for getting them to approve the project. Yeah, I've never had anyone walk away from me asking for too much money. And I've asked for a million and a half dollars to do a project. I didn't get it. 
not because I asked for too much money, right? I, I've, a, I've had, I've lost about maybe a quarter of my deals from asking okay. for too much money. Yeah. Okay. So, and maybe that's a difference in our approaches, right? That people like, if people are coming in saying we want something over your $250,000 tier, I can say, sure, how about ridiculous numbers, right? Um, so there's a little bit more of self-filtering when people come to me. But um, you know, I've certainly lost contracts, but it hasn't been for financial reasons. Um, the more, more usually people come back and they say, could you put together a different budget? Um, but a really key yeah. thing in that negotiation is you don't want it focused on you. And this is both for your own emotional well-being and for negotiating with them. It's focused on the work. To do this right, it will take X. Yes. yes. Right? Not I am worth X. Because you know what? You're worth a lot. You're, you, you're an invaluable yes. human being with a unique perspective on the world. There's no amount of money that could possibly pay for your worth. Right? This is not about your worth. This is about finding the time and resources to do the work the right way. And if you say that to them, then the discussion becomes about, great, are there ways that we can do this the right way for less money? So things that I've done actually with partners are to say, well, you can't give me enough money to do this right, but what if you gave me one of your internal programmers for six months, right? So I don't have to pay a programmer. That's often much cheaper for them and much easier for them to task existing resources to help you. So once the focus is on the work, it makes the negotiations much easier. You manage them. Don't let what? them manage you. You're they, the oh, one in God, charge. yes. Right. You're, You're in charge. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? They're the ones with the problem. Their life yeah. is going to suck if they don't hire you. Right? Yeah. You can always walk away. There's more clients out there. Right? They're the ones who are going to be doing something that's crappy and be sad about it. Yeah, so you're if the, they don't want you, whatever. You're the one who knows the path sorry, to Jay, their problem ahead. to their solution. No, sorry. It's, it keeps being this lag on me. Yeah. Um, I yeah, know. And, I know. I know. <laughs> Yeah, you're the one who knows the path from their, their problem to their solution. And if they have a reservation, it's not because they're judging you. It's because they don't understand how to make that connection. So that's a teaching moment for them, not a, like, you go and pass the bar moment for you. So let's get another question or two from chat. Excellent. Um, so the next question uh, appearing is from... Uh, uh, Jason Pitt, uh, it is, what is the potential market for GMing or game mastering as entertainment service, uh, services for corporate contexts in the world of online conferences? Does that make sense? Do you want me to repeat? Oh, yeah, it makes sense. I, I'm just, that is outside my area of expertise. Jay, you want to take that? Let me think about that for a second. Um... So let's translate that into the language of the customer, right? So first of all, um, it's GMing versus any other sort of game they're not going to understand the distinction from. So it's play as entertainment, right? So it's some sort of game-related entertainment for them um, at online conferences or, you know, for t their team building or in their organization. Um, if you're talking about team building, most companies have a team building budget. Um, that they have to spend every year. Um, this is what we call, from our point of view, this is what we, what we call a red ocean. Um, and so the idea is uh, if you, a blue ocean versus a red ocean. A red ocean is like focus sharks that are fighting each other because like this like that business metaphor was created by somebody who's like super bro, right? He's like, yeah, there's sharks in an ocean. They're fighting each other. It's like red. But the point is like, it's a competitive space with a lot of solutions and they have to pick you. A blue ocean is a space where um, there is less uh, kind of, there are fewer options out there. And so anybody entering the space really notices you, right? Um, so I do think on one hand that, you know, uh, kind of team building and entertain, corporate entertainment is a space that has a lot of money designated already and the money flows very easily. People know what their budget is. They're like, okay, I have 10K for team building at the end of the year, you know, let's do it. Um, but also then you're like, competing with 60 different people, but also most of them aren't games, right? So that's about getting your experience in front of the right decision makers and running demos um, so that they know how fun it is and they viscerally understand how different what you do is from anyone else. 
Um, and I will actually say there's a common saying, don't do free work in consulting. I don't believe that. We get the vast majority of our new clients from doing free work because experience design is so different um, that being able to do something to like freely get them that visceral impression, like I, I do anything for that. Right? Like sometimes I pay to get that impression in front of people. Um, do the right kind of free work. If someone asks yes. you to do free work, it's not a good idea. You yeah. should be making strategic decisions about when free work benefits you. Yeah. But again, like, I don't it's get not paid about any of the talks I do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Right. I get paid. I don't get paid for speaking. Right. I could. I could charge. But that's not the point of why I give talks. So I don't. In terms um, of entertainment. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I'll take this actually for a second. So I just want to say what Jay has just done is reframed your idea in terms of value to people who have money. There are other ways to reframe it. So what she's done is said, okay, maybe we reframe this as a team building exercise, right? What is the problem that you have? Well, at online conferences, we don't get um, uh, uh, people going out to dinner together and forming relation, the kind of relationships that they would you know, in a physical conference. There are other ways to reframe it. So for example, um, you could talk about um, making how do you connect people across different areas of your institution, right? And get them to work on a problem together in a playful way. Or maybe the problem is um, we want to have a party and, and, and it just, it's just depressing to get everybody together on Zoom and we want some way to make showcase like different people being awesome. So if you can put it in terms of a problem that they already have, you're much more likely to be able to sell it. And I think there are at least a dozen stories you could tell based on this concept. The trick is picking the one that there's money for and that the people who have the money are experiencing pain. Yeah. Yeah, I think the really big takeaway is that is follow the money. Like money has ways that it already flows and you can and it is a hundred times harder to fight money uphill than it is to go where money is already flowing and make your pitch there. And you just don't know like in detail, right? Like we're giving you some outlines, but like in your particular case for your particular people, you just need to go find out. Um, and the way that you find out is give them an example of what it's like and then straight up bloody ask them. Right. Like, so if you're doing a demo of a game at a conference, you can make the last move of that game. Hey, everybody, uh, why don't you draw a little outline of what it would be like to like run this game for your own team and then hand that in. Right. And it's like a fun exercise at the end of the game. But now you have everybody's names, email addresses and a picture of whether they actually think they can run, run for their own team. Um, and then just say like, you know, and sometimes I'll just ask like, so you've had this experience. I would love to sell more of this experience to you. What does that take? Is that a conversation we can have? Like there is no question that is rude. You can also contact people and say, what are the biggest problems that you have? Hey, I hear you organize online conferences. What sucks? Yeah. Right? How can I, I'm looking for ways that I can make your life easier. I have a bunch of tools at hand. Would you just be willing to talk to me about some of the things that are hard for you? And you don't, you don't even go into selling them immediately. You use that to go back and refine a pitch that maybe you take to them, maybe you take to other people as well. So don't underestimate the role of doing pop-up research, right? Like really low key, really low fi Just try to get people to tell you the things that bug them. And that can be really rewarding. And you have a huge edge on everybody else in the industry in the Red Ocean that does this because nobody does experience design in the corporate world. Like we win, we are the best and most enjoyable and most valuable event at every conference we go to. And we hear that all the time from organizers and everything. Like we just win every conference because we have bring experience to some, right? Um, and like there's an entire field of facilitation that kind of has nothing on jamming, right? Like, so just like the, the sheer amount of value you have to bring is astronomical and 10% of that will blow their mind. So it's just about making them realize that. Great. What else have we got in the chat? All right. Um, so I'm going to actually combo two p different people's questions because I feel like they feed into each other. Um, so Entro Games uh, originally wrote, uh, where do you find RFPs? Uh, and 49th uh, also wrote, uh, how do you know and 
how do you know which institutions have the right type of funding for your project and how do you navigate to secure it? Uh, I sorry, I feel those are connected. So I wanted to. Yeah, they are connected. Them. Yeah. Um, Jay, you want to start or shall I? That's totally you. Okay. So um, the, look, earlier in my, most of my best connections have come from my network, but I don't mean my network of people who are game designers. I mean my network of people who are not game designers because they see things that I wouldn't otherwise see. So one thing that I do that's been incredibly productive is I have an elevator pitch of what I do, right? I'm Jessica Hammer. I do transformational games. If you want a game that changes how people think, feel, or behave, send them to me, right? And people outside my game design network send me stuff all the time because they've heard me say that sentence and it sticks in their head. So you should be thinking about what your elevator pitch is and how you can leverage your network to have experts in domains that are not games point you towards sources of money that they know about because they're experts in their field. Okay. So that's one really critical thing. Um, Just quickly, how many partners of, do you oh, already have for your games who have corporate jobs that they can bring you into their day organizations? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've also, I've gotten so many um, referrals from my students, right? They'll be like, oh, Jess, you know, my boss wants to talk to someone about games. And like, you, you taught me about games. So I know, you know, there are some, some PhD folks in the audience uh, who may be teaching game design classes. Like your students may be calling you five years later when they're in charge of stuff. Um, obviously, five years, you, you, wanna, you wanna be getting started sooner than that. But uh, uh, making sure that your network understands your brand and thinking about that as branding to people outside of game design, right? We can be a very, um, internally focused community and like having like the next cool game designer talking about your stuff helps you absolutely zero, right? It's the person who works in ceiling manufacturing who's going to tell you where the money is in ceiling manufacturing. Um, in terms of formal RFPs, um, I uh, am on a bunch of mailing lists, which is really, really helpful. Um, these are specifically a lot of them for academic um, projects, but not all. So. Um, uh, uh, if you are in a, how about this? If you're in academia, you can follow up with me and I'll help you get on the right lists. Um, but that, those are mostly for writing grants. So specifically for proposing to do research as part of making a game. Um, in terms of RFPs that are really just focused on game making, um, you can, uh, sort of do a bunch of, there are RFP repositories for RFPs that different companies put out. So you can identify, say, like 20 companies that you have an interest in, and you can set up Google Alerts for when they have a new RFP. And you'll actually get a lot of irrelevant RFPs. That's fine. You'll learn how to read the RFPs pretty quickly to see if it might fit you or not. So one of the things that I've developed over time is kind of five lenses that I like using games to solve problems with. Um, and so I just, when I read an RFP, I read it through, could I do one of these five things? And if not, whatever, I'll get the next one. Um, and uh, those are some specific techniques that you can what, use. What are your five things? Oh, God, could I even articulate them? Uh, let's see. Yeah, you know what? I want to keep this focused on questions. I'm happy to we'll follow up on that another time. I'll give you one example. So one example is um, uh, using games to help people associate different affective states with an experience right? So usually I feel sad when I do X. I did X and I felt happy while I was doing it, right? That's one design technique that I really, really enjoy. And there's a bunch of research suggesting that it's effective. So that's, that's sort of one direction is I'm like, if there's an RFP that I can address by doing that, do it. Um, you'll also just learn through networks and over time where the pools of money are. So for example, there's a lot of money in um, smoking reduction games because the tobacco settlements all went into these funds for helping people deal with the effects of nicotine. So, you know, you can kind of, um, again, you can kind of follow the money. Like if you follow the news and there's 
you know, people are dedicating money to research something or to intervene in something, you can follow that. Um, there's also, uh, uh, it's, I think it's called Foundation Finder or Grant Foundation Grant Finder, uh, where you can search for grants that come from foundations, which are sort of bi these big endowed organizations. And foundations will generally be very clear about the areas in which they want to make an impact. Some of them will explicitly mention games, but most of them will say, we want to make an impact in areas A, B, and C. And if you can make it clear to them that games will help make an impact in that area, they often have very large budgets and are looking for things that are both new and effective. So those are some high level thoughts that I hope are helpful. I think for me, I actually personally hate RFPs um, because it's just a laborious process and you don't know whether you're going to get it. Um, and you don't have a lot of control over the interaction. And I like control. <laughs> um, but yeah. like for me, I think if I broaden the question to like, how do I get projects? Like, where do I go to get projects? I think more than anything else, and this will sound kind of strange, but the best way to get projects is to do projects. Um, and especially if you're starting out, do a project, any project, like, you know, whatever you can get. If you can get a project for $500, just do it. Because that will give you the language to start searching for projects in that way. And it will, and the people who have projects know other people who have projects and they will talk about you. Um, so just kind of do anything to accept any project. And it's actually, I think a lot of times when we start out, we want to know that the truth is out there and that like, if we do these things, it will get us the outcome we want, right? And we want there to be a place to go where there's a list of, you know, potential opportunities so that we can have that security. But for me, it actually works the opposite way. Like nothing has been more powerful for me than karma. Um, and just making sure that people work with me and are happy and then somehow it all turns around. Um, but the, the flip side of this is that I will say that um, in at least on the corporate side, sales cycles are insanely long. Um, so we, we have spent over a year getting proposals through sometimes. Um, sometimes you'll talk to somebody and you know they'll do a little project with you now and then uh, they'll want to you know work you into their budget for next year but they don't work on their map uh, but you're working talking to them in February and they don't get their next budget until you know uh, September and then that they'll be able to work with you in January again right or there might be a year and a half based on how the timing works um, so be prepared if you're getting into this that you are not counting on regular cash flow until you have uh, ramped up to a certain level. Um, I strongly, I, I, I will say it's so variable, right? Sometimes it's like 24 hours later, they they have yeah. a contract and want to hand you like a hundred thousand dollars. And sometimes it's a year and a half and you don't know going in. So one of the things to think about is you want to have a, a, a pipeline. So you don't want to be chasing one thing at a time. Um, if you have a proposal for like, I think I can make a game that, um, uh, uh, helps uh, uh, reduce stress in nurses, right? You can say, okay, sure. So I could, I could pitch this to 12 different organizations and I'll search for RFPs about it because you've already done the, material, the thinking, right? Um, and that will help you have a broad pipeline because not everything comes through. In academia, three percent—it's like three to five percent for for um, national like uh, government grants—and you just work around that by, you know, having a bunch of different projects on the fire, and some of them will hit and yeah. some of them won't, yeah. and dealing productively with rejection. So yeah. that's another critical thing. If you get rejected for a project, like there's only one bad outcome where you get committed to do a project and you spend a lot of time and effort and it sucks. Like sucks for you is a bad experience, pisses off the client, whatever it is, that's the only bad outcome. Yeah. So if you miss out on a project that you would have been great for, whatever, there are more projects out there. There are so many people who need our help as game designers. Um, I know that at the stage I'm at in my career, I have more stuff going on than I can handle. I'm already outsourcing stuff to people. Um, and I'm only, you know, I'm not, I, I got a long ways to grow. So um, it's okay to miss out on opportunities. Um, there will be more. That's why I would say, you know, you don't want to work for people who ask you to work for free. I agree with Jay. There are times to do free work. 
doing a first project, maybe you are doing it for free, maybe you're getting paid a very minimal amount of money, but you want to make sure that it's the right partnership and that these aren't people who think that it's only worthwhile because you don't yeah. have value. Um, don't work with people who don't value you and who don't treat you with respect. Um, that is a hard line for me, and I have turned down large sums of money because of it, and that is the best thing that I can advise for you to do as well. You are worthy of being treated with respect as a human being, regardless of what the person you're collaborating with problem is or how good your game is at solving it. Doesn't matter. Don't work with jerks. You're going to be really sorry when it sucks up all your time and energy. Any last thoughts, Jay? Because I think we're just about at time. Oh, yeah, we, um, we have about a three-minute warning. Um, okay. So. Uh, let me respond then to the thing that you said about rejection. Um, and I think that's absolutely true, that you can work really hard on a proposal or a bid and lose it for no reason that has to do with you. Right, like I have stayed out every night for a week and then like lost a bit at the very last minute and my point of contact calls me apologizing because his boss swooped in and overrode him, right? Um, and that just happens some fraction of the time. So the way that I do this with my own morale is that like I say that I experience design the fuck out of everything. I say every interaction I have with every person, um, I want them to have a fantastic experience and to get value out of every call they have with me, even before the project is approved. So that way, whether or not the project is approved, which I don't have control over, and to an extent they may not have full control over either, they remember how much value they got from me so that if it's not this project, they'll come back. And even if they never come back, like I have learned so much from being able to deliver value from that, uh, to them in that interaction. And we often have this mistaken understanding or th this kind of fallacy that, uh, that the people with the money on the other side know exactly what they want. It is actually rarely the case that they know what yeah. they want. Like, Correct. Yeah. Like you, so they may, you may think like, oh, well, I don't want to start doing anything until they've approved it. Just start giving them what they need, like straight out off the bat, and they will realize how much more of what they need you can give them. Um, and they probably need you to handhold them a little bit through it, especially if it's their first time. You look like you had something to add to that. I was going to say, um, I, I think we're ju just about time. So I want to close by thanking you, Jay, for being on this panel with me. This was super fun. Um, thanking our uh, moderator, Melissa, and our technical uh, 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 technical -er, the, the 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 people making all of the technology go behind the scenes. And also thank you for coming and listening and having great questions for us. We know we weren't able to cover everything and probably each of you have different questions and concerns, but um, find us on the Discord. Jay and I are both open to talking about these things and helping you with your questions because, you know, everybody starts from the same place, right? Which is, which is from scratch. And um, we want people to have it easier making the transition into consulting success than we did. Yeah, um, uh, one, one last thing. If people uh, in this panel watching it would like to find more information about you or your companies or hiring you, what would be the websites or way of contacting you? Great. Um, the, my uh, website is replayable.net. Um, they'll find a bunch of information about my academic research as well as ways to contact me about being a consultant. My website is prototypethinking.io and I dropped it into chat. All right, great. Well, it looks like that we are wrapped up. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And our technician, Joe, I think you can.